Tonight on Panorama, we ask how could hundreds of patients be killed in one small British hospital? It just got worse and worse and began shouting at each other. And I said, well, actually, you're murdering him, aren't you? All these people had their lives shortened in a place they went to get help. She didn't deserve that. She wasn't ready to go. She was a fun-loving lady. We hear from those who tried to stop the killing. What did I miss out in trying to convince the police? This was a case you have got to look into seriously. Mr Millet, hi. For the first time, we call people to account. Hundreds of people had their lives shortened. They were killed on your watch. Why didn't you protect them? Don't, don't do that to the camera, please. And we confront the doctor being blamed for the deaths. Why did so many people lose their lives on that ward? This is the story of a community hospital with the darkest of secrets. Hundreds of people had their lives shortened here. People like war veteran Robert Wilson. He had health problems, but in 1998 went to hospital with a broken shoulder. He was funny. Um, he, was, he was hilarious at times, you know. Like telling his stories of the Navy and D-Day. Like many other elderly patients, Robert was sent to Gosport War Memorial Hospital to recuperate. I thought he was getting better, and I thought, well, a few days in another place, he would be home sort of thing, you know. But it didn't work out that way. He was put on diamorphine, or medical heroin. Now, Robert was in pain, but these were huge doses, continuously pumped into him by this device, a syringe driver. He became unconscious. Two days later, he was dead. My last, <laughs> my last memory of my dad uh, was that he, um, as I left the room, I said, I'll be back, Dad. Um, and he lifted his hand and he tried to reach out to me and I left the room and that was the last time I saw my father alive. Robert's death was not a one-off. In the 90s, many patients died here after being given strong painkillers in large doses. An official investigation found between 450 and 650 patients had their lives shortened. Hospital managers and consultants failed to stop it. The report said that in here, there was a total disregard for human life. It said there was a culture of shortening lives. It's a peculiar phrase, shortening a life. If, if you're going to shorten anyone, anyone's life, what do you get called? You know, there's, there's a word for it. If you shorten someone's life, you're a killer. That official investigation published a million pages of evidence about the deaths. We've spent months digging through the paperwork to try and work out why so many people lost their lives. Some of what we've found is shocking. There are documents about Robert Wilson. Remember, he was sent to Gosport to get better, but the nurse who admitted him concluded he was dying. The prognosis that I made was that he was being admitted for terminal care at Dryad Ward. Until we told them, the family were unaware of the nurse's assessment. What she said was when your father arrived at the ward, 
He was being admitted for terminal care, that's what she said. Wow, that's unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. My father, arriving at the War Memorial Hospital, he would have been discombobulated, confused, he would have been grumpy. And I think arriving in that state is pretty much what, set, what signed his death warrant. What is extraordinary is the expert appointed by the government to investigate concluded patients were killed by staff. I discovered in the records this phrase, please make comfortable. And I think that's uh, described for me what seemed to have been going on. And I concluded that that may well have shortened the lives of some patients. Some may even have been able to leave hospital alive. So they were killed by the hospital? That was what I thought. The phrase, make comfortable, became a death sentence for hundreds of patients. And this is the GP who wrote it. Jane Barton was the main doctor on the wards between 1988 and 2000. In those years, the death rate doubled. She's never spoken to the media, but her husband defended her after the official report was published. She has always maintained that she was a hard-working, dedicated doctor, doing the best for her patients in a very inadequately resourced part of the health service. Many of those who died went to Gosport for rehabilitation after operations, like Ethel Thurston, who'd had her hip done. She'd been there four weeks when her niece visited. First time I saw her in Gosport, she was fine, but they said she hadn't been eating. And we laughed and we joked, and she was fine. Dr Barton saw Ethel the next day and prescribed a massive dose of diamorphine. She wrote, Further deterioration. Please keep comfortable. I am happy for nursing staff to confirm death. The following day I went and there she was laying completely white as a sheet, comatose, as far as I thought she was comatose, and um, she took her last few breaths while I was there. It was a big dose. She'd never had it before. They must have known that it would kill her. When patients are dying, they are often made comfortable with powerful painkillers. But at Gosport, patients who weren't dying were still given massive doses. We want to know why. It's uh, Richard Bilton here from the BBC. Did you work at uh, Gosport Hospital? The nurses who worked on the wards must know. So were you there when Dr Barton was there? She just rang off. Some could still face prosecution because it was nurses who administered the drugs. Did you ever hear anything when you were there about people being concerned? No. Did you know Dr Barton? You liked her very much. Did you see anything that I, like that? No. Would you be prepared to meet me and have a chat? Can't you? God, it, it, it's, it's, it's really confusing because you do talk to nurses like that who say, I didn't see anything and all we did was have a kind of regime of care. Only one nurse would go on camera. She ran one of the wards where the official report says patients' lives were shortened. As far as I am concerned, Dr Barton didn't shorten any lives on my ward. I mean, a lot of people who've read that report will think that you were right in the middle of this system of of, of ending lives, mm. t killing people. Yeah. What would you say to those people? I would like to say that they were nursed to the best of my ability and they had what every patient is entitled to, peaceful, pain-free, dignity, and I mean dignified death. But is there a possibility that Dr Barton decided when end of life started and she decided that too early? Not on my ward, no. 
No. The files tell a different story. Some nurses did think patients were being killed. We found their police statements. They've never been reported before. It seemed most of the patients were going on drivers, even when they were not in pain. I don't recall anyone going on to a syringe driver who did not die. I think that diamorphine was used to keep the waiting lists down. It got to the stage that every time Dr Barton came to the annex, I would think to myself, who's going to die now? I remain deeply upset and feel terribly guilty about one particular death. This auxiliary nurse is talking about a patient called Dennis Brickwood. He had a hip operation and went to Gosport for rehab. We just felt that each week, if you like, he was just, just getting better and better, fitter and fitter. He didn't seem to be complaining of pain. Not once. Not once he might we, say, oh, I had a bit of an achy back, but then he was in bed. But the auxiliary nurse was concerned. She thought Dennis was exaggerating his symptoms, and that could be dangerous. I remember having a conversation with one of the other auxiliaries. We agreed if he wasn't careful, he would talk himself onto a syringe driver. Dr Barton did prescribe diamorphine by syringe driver and told staff to make Dennis comfortable. When the family arrived, they found him unconscious. They confronted a senior nurse. I said, what's up with Dad? And he said, oh, he's fine. He's fine. He's at peace. He's, he's at peace. He's not in any, any pain. pain. Um, you said, when, when will oh, Dad yeah, wake when, up? When yes. will he wake up? And he, and he said, oh, no, no, he won't wake up. So Graham said, why? He said, oh, no, he won't wake up. So Graham said, uh, well, can't you take it out? He said, oh, no, 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 said, we, no, no. He, we can't take it out. He's at fine, all this. And he's at peace. He's fine, he's at peace. The auxiliary says she confronted the same senior nurse. Until we told them, Dennis's family never knew one of the staff tried to protect him. This is what she told the police. Knowing Mr Brickwood as I did, I am confident that he would not have allowed the introduction of a syringe driver had he known of the outcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the... Uh, How does that feel to hear that? That feels awful. Yeah, yeah it's dreadful. That was really awful. Um, he wasn't 100%, but we're adamant as a, as a family that he wasn't ready to go at that particular at that time. Moment. And at that moment, no way. A day after the syringe driver was switched on, Dennis died. Dr Barton wrote the prescription that led to his death and hundreds of others like it. I want to know why, but she hasn't answered any of our questions. Dr Burton, hi, it's Richard Bilton from BBC News. Dr Barton goes into her garage. Could I ask you a quick question, please? But her husband comes out. Sir, can I just ask you? I'm from BBC Panorama. Oh, I know who you are. Yeah, and I wrote and asked some questions and Dr Barton didn't answer them, so... Because so this, if I could... is all, this is all so you can just say you gave us every opportunity to talk and we didn't? No, I asked you questions which I hoped you'd answer. Um, and now I'd like to put those questions to Dr Barton. It's a very complicated story. And, and we've not heard we've from had, her. And the advice we've had is not to speak to the media. Why did so many people lose their lives in that hospital? Have their lives shortened? They were killed? Are you suggesting that she murdered them now? Is that I, what you're suggesting? Oh, I'm suggesting that you said they were killed. 400 people had their lives shortened, which I think is killed, isn't it? Um, isn't it? 400 people had their lives shortened. Shortened, as opposed to killed. But so why life, hasn't she not been charged? With life why hasn't she been charged with murder? Then? I, I don't know. All right. Well, then perhaps you have to address these questions to the police. Well, Hampshire police have investigated Dr Barton three times. The first death they looked at was a complex one. 
91-year-old Gladys Richards had dementia, but she went to Gosport to recover from a hip operation. Dr. Barton had written up frail elderly lady, not obviously in pain. I am quite happy for nursing staff to confirm death. Dr. Barton prescribed diamorphine via syringe driver. Four days after it started, Gladys died. So I rang up the police and said, I have concerns over my mother's death and I wish to lodge an allegation of unlawful killing. He said, there, there, my dear, you're upset over the death of your mother. I said, no, let's get this straight. I am reporting this on points of law. But the police didn't take it seriously, and the deaths continued for another two years. I am upset that, that there was something I didn't do. I'm sorry. Uh, something I didn't do, something I didn't say, something I overlooked, that there were 60 more deaths after my mother's death. How else could, what did, I, what did I miss out in trying to convince the police this was a case you have got to look into seriously? There were two further police investigations, but nobody has been charged. In October, the chief constable came to apologise to the Gosport families for her force's failings. She wouldn't do an interview, so I caught up with her as she left. Chief Constable, I, I have to ask you some questions. One message to, to, to the people of Gosport, because the two people that they trusted in this situation were the hospital, who initially cared for their loved ones, and then the police. When things went wrong, they looked to the police, and both of those institutions failed. What do you say to them? I say what I said in June, and I've said again privately to the families today. Yes, Hampton Constabulary, in our part, were one of many institutions that failed those families over that period. There is so much learning for us as a society, as a range of agencies. I know my organisation's taking that very seriously and we are playing our part, but so are so many others. And that's where this focus needs to be. Thank you. The deaths should have been stopped long before the police became involved. Back in 1991, right at the start of the killing, a group of nurses warned about what was happening on the wards. They said not all patients given diamorphine have pain. The drug regime is used indiscriminately. That patients' deaths are sometimes hastened unnecessarily. The nurses were right on every count. But when they put their concerns to Dr Barton and the hospital managers, they were told they were wrong. The nurses were sent back to the wards and hundreds more people were killed. I think that's a very dangerous information to ignore. Why? I, well, people are going to come to harm as a result, so I don't know how, you, I don't know how to defend it. Yet managers did ignore it? It would appear so, yes. And people died as a result? That's correct. One man could have stopped the killing. Any fresh pair of eyes coming in from outside can only help frontline clinical teams improve their practice. Max Millett was the manager of Gosport Hospital. He then became the boss of the hospital trust. He was told about the nurses' complaints in 1991 and didn't act. So all these deaths could have been avoided. There were other warnings, including the police investigating death on the wards. From the time he was first warned, there were 400 more deaths. This was a hospital that was killing people and he ran it. Mr Millett says we should talk to the NHS, but these are questions only he can answer. Mr Millett, hi. It's Richard Bilton from BBC Panorama. Did you run a hospital that killed people, sir? 
Hundreds of people had their lives shortened. They were killed on your watch. Why didn't you protect them? And why did you ignore the warnings, sir? People want to know, why did you ignore those warnings? Nothing to add to the But 91, mid-90s, 98, 99, there were loads of warnings and people kept dying. Sir, this is your chance. Just give us your side. Just answer the question, sir. Mr Millet. Ah, oh, Mr Millet. It's so frustrating. There are so many questions about this story, how it could happen, why it could happen. That man was in charge. He's never answered those questions, and he hasn't today. That's so frustrating. Max Millet was in charge, but he didn't write the prescriptions that killed people. She did. Jane Barton was disciplined by the General Medical Council in 2010 for serious misconduct, but she wasn't struck off and she retired. Consultants who'd approved her practices weren't investigated. Dr. Barton said she was overworked and patients were too poorly for rehab. Many former colleagues agree. I know at one time, if I can say it on television, we were thought we were a dumping ground. A dumping ground? Mm. Yeah. They were blocking acute medical beds and we had the empty beds. They were sent to us. We were hoping we could, oh, you know, rehabilitate them, which we did, we tried. But it soon became apparent that they were nursing care and they had damn good nursing care, I tell you. But they weren't rehabilitation. What did that mean then for the patient? They were with us until they died. But Dr. Barton's drugs accelerated those deaths. By 2002, dozens of families had gone to the police and a major investigation was looking at 94 deaths. The officer in charge is talking about the case for the first time. This is probably the most significant investigation that I was involved in, in over 31 years of policing. My view was that there was sufficient evidence to put the matter before a court, and there was an overriding public interest in putting the matter before a court. Were people murdered in Gosport Hospital? I can't say that. It's not my job to decide upon charges. I gather evidence and I put them before the Crown Prosecution Service. It's for them to decide what charges are relevant. Documents show the CPS looked at possible charges of manslaughter and murder. One of the 10 cases prosecutors examined was this man's stepfather. Brian Cunningham went to Gosport to be treated for a painful bed sore. I went to the hospital and on the way in, you ask at the reception desk, where is my stepfather, Brian Cunningham? I said, I was in Dryad Ward. I remember somebody in the cubicle said, ah, oh, mate, that's the, the death ward. When he arrived at hospital, Brian was distressed and became abusive towards staff. Though he was very ill, Dr. Barton knew Brian's condition was not yet terminal, but she still prescribed a lethal diamorphine syringe driver the same day. She wrote, Make comfortable, give adequate analgesia. I am happy for nursing staff to confirm death. And as soon as I saw this stuck in my stepfather, I knew exactly what was going on. They were actually disposing of him. Were, his life has been terminated. I said, look, I'd like to speak to Brian. Uh, will you please remove the syringe driver, allow him to recover enough for me to speak to him? And uh, she said, well, I'm not going to agree. I, I can't agree to this. And it just got, just got worse and worse. And uh, we were, began shouting at each other. And I said, well, actually, you're murdering him, aren't you? Prosecutors decided there wasn't a reasonable chance of securing a conviction. 
Despite detectives reviewing thousands of pages of evidence and taking more than 800 witness statements, no one has ever faced justice. What did you think when they said, we're not going to press ahead, we're not going to bring charges? I thought it was a big mistake. Why? Because I knew what the response of the families was going to be. I knew what the response of the public was going to be. Uh, and I do recall talking to the uh, prosecutors and saying that this will end up in a public inquiry and eventually I think the matter will go before a court. All of these people in one small town. Their lives cut short by a hospital that should have protected them. The killing went on for more than a decade and no one stopped it. My father didn't want to die like that. He had life left in him, 75. You know, he could have been going into his 80s, maybe even, maybe even his 90s. I don't, I, I don't know. That was taken away. Um, my, my father's life was ended by someone else. She was a poor lady who didn't fully understand what was going on. She didn't deserve that. She wasn't ready to go. She was a fun-loving lady. I want Barton charged in the criminal court. I would put it as murder. Intent that these patients were not going to survive. The allegations against Dr Barton could not be more serious. She's accused of drugging hundreds of patients to death. And I still want to get the answers the families need. Dr Barton. Hi, it's Richard Bilson. I'm from BBC Panorama. I just want to ask you a couple of questions. I've tried very hard. Don't, don't do that to the camera, please. Can you tell me why hundreds of people died on that ward? Let me just, uh, it's just a question. Harris, Dr. She Martin, has said she does not want to speak. Why did so many people lose their lives on that ward? Because the families, they say that they want justice. Do you understand why they might want to see you on trial? Could you just, Could you just tell our viewers, Dr. Barton, what happened on those wards? Just one last question, Dr. Barton. What happened on those wards? That question, what happened on those wards, is being asked again by a new team from Kent and Essex Police. They're reviewing 30 years of evidence, but the man who ran the last investigation says there's already enough to bring charges. Do you think the evidence will ever be strong enough to go before a court? I think it's strong enough now. I think it was strong enough then. And I think there was an overriding public interest in it doing so. The Gosport families have been waiting decades for justice. There are still hundreds of people suffering because of the hospital that killed people.